Hello everyone! Welcome to a Let's Play of King's Quest V. My name is Anna Mardal. When we last left off, we had visited the town and forest of Serenia, and we've basically seen all 12 squares of that map, and we're about to go out into the 70 square desert. It's actually 73 squares, 74 squares. It's a lot of squares. The desert is bordered on all sides by endless desert and also several death by scorpion bite um, screens. So we're going to be careful. You also, uh, you absolutely need to stop at oases. There's nothing but a hot, dry desert further west. Most people avoid it because there are bandits out there. If you insist on going, I'll wait for you here. <laughs> That's fair enough. There's really nowhere for... Oh, we're really zooming along. There's really nowhere for um, him to perch, as you can see. It's, it's just endless desert. There are one, two, three, four... Four oases in the desert and six places to drink water. I will show you all of them because where else are you going to see them all? All around him, Graham sees nothing but more desert. How much further can he go on? Thankfully though, a nearby pool of water can relieve Graham's overwhelming thirst. A small oasis. It's tantalizing water, so sparkling in the desert sun. Graham's hot, thirsty body is irresistibly drawn to it. Life-giving water, nectar of the gods. Graham can feel renewal flowing through him. I am pretty sure that the uh, desert is based on um, how, how quickly or how long it takes to, to die of thirst is based on the number of screens you travel rather than the old Sierra method of like counting clock cycles which meant that the games became unplayable as computers became faster. They held on to that trick way longer than they really should have long after they knew it was a problem. But this is screen based so that makes it something that can work in the future. Um, and the Oasis are beautiful. They're animated. They're all unique. Um, very, very pretty. This one's got, uh, I call this the Three Tree Oasis, and they're all kind of curving together to, um, to give the, the Oasis some shade. So we're going to go back. This is directly west of the Beehive. We're going to go back one west square, and then we're going to go south one... Two, three, four. There we go. The hot sun and choking sands are taking their toll on Graham. He must drink soon. A rope and water basket sit near a small well. It's actually animated. It's going all the way down. And he's pulling it back up. Nectar of the gods! Um, this oasis is one that most people don't see because you really don't need to be down here. And it's kind of actually hard to get down here uh, unless you just happen to know that this is here. So, uh, we thank our map that I bought for $9.95 for showing us the way. We're going to go north one screen and west and west again. And west one more time.
here is another oasis, obviously. It's kind of like a, a big snaky tree. Fun fact, that is exactly what my spine looks like. If you've ever wondered, what does Anna's spine look like? Which is a perfectly natural, normal thing to wonder about your favorite Let's Player. Um, that is the answer. Two screens north of that oasis, we find, oh no, a picked clean and sun bleached skeleton of a man lies in the sand of a hot dry desert. What happened? Who can say, but it makes Graham uneasy nevertheless. An old shoe, forgotten, lies next to the poor man's skeleton. Uneasily, Graham reaches down and removes the old shoe from the desert sand. If you got here by random, this is one of the few markers in the desert that actually is a, a marker and isn't just endless sand. It might be a clue that he looks like he's dragging himself this way. Um, and if you go this way, just two screens away, so close is the oasis that we've already been to. But that perhaps he was trying to reach? Oh, just walk right through it, Graham. It's not like your life depends on the water you're about to drink. Get it all mucky and sandy. Grit is good for your digestive system. We're gonna go south one. If we were to go south any further, we would hit just endless forever desert. That's not on our map, except just as an endless desert marker. But we're gonna go west. One more screen. I think it's one more screen. Well, this is interesting. Two tents sit silently in the desert, apparently deserted for the moment. A flaming campfire makes the oppressive heat of the desert even worse. A large clay jar full of water stands by the campfire. So we kind of no clip glided over there. Whee! This is the sneaky, we're breaking into a house type of music that Sierra uses in Quest for Glory games. Or if it's not the same music, it's very similar. But there's nobody here now, and nothing here that looks worth stealing. So it's probably just more imagination. Uh, okay, let's go east. Don't get the impression that we're supposed to be there right now. And we'll go north. That was weird. He got a little confused. And we'll go north again. And we'll go north one more time. This is the fourth and final oasis in the desert. Uh, the first one, of course, was the three trees in a cluster. Then we found the, um, the well and the scoliosis spine tree, and this is the water from a rock tree. Or oasis. <laughs> water from a rock with trees. I'm gonna go north from here. The scorching sun burns down on the dry desert as Graham struggles through the hot sand. He looks around, but all he can see is more desert. This is something. Rocky cliffs rise high above Graham's head. So we can't go north, there's just cliffs here. Well, let's go uh, back east. And east again. And this is interesting. There's a temple here. And an unusual outcropping of rock. A small oasis is formed in the space between the two rocks. This is the um, 
I guess you could call this an oasis, but I just call it a watering hole. From across the desert sands, Graham can hear the sound of approaching hoofbeats. Unfortunately, we've hidden ourselves behind this rock here. Those must be the bandits Cedric warned us about. Open sesame! And the door closed behind him. He doesn't have that bag he was carrying anymore. And off they go. Somehow, miraculously, they didn't see us, even though they should have. But if we're hidden from if you're hidden from the viewer, then nobody can see you. Uh, let's go get a close-up of this temple. Looming before him, the huge temple door beckons tantalizingly to Graham. Stone statues of Pegasus guard the old crumbling temple. Built into the rocky cliffs, an ancient temple towers above Graham as he surveys its ornately carved columns and friezes. Open sesame! The temple door won't open. Perhaps there's something missing. Well, it would seem that that staff is important to the process. Um, now, Cedric did warn us that there were bandits in the desert. Presumably, they are, had they found this temple and figured out how to open it, and they've been keeping their loot in it, which I guess makes a kind of sense. Uh, it's harder to steal uh, loot if it's behind a locked door as opposed to in your tents in the middle of the desert. Tents are notoriously bad places to keep loot, probably. You can just knock a tent over, set it on fire, or otherwise vandalize it. So I guess it sort of makes sense that they would um, take advantage of this existing temple security system in place. Okay, now I want to be careful here. Down one screen. Two screens. Three screens south. And we want to go west of the camp. Well, it's not abandoned anymore. Overhearing loud music and laughter from within the larger tent, Graham guesses the bandits must be celebrating their latest plunder. A beautiful girl belly dances for the rowdy bandits. With disgust, Graham looks at the drunken bandit lying face down in the desert sand, completely passed out. A large clay jar full of water stands by the campfire. There doesn't seem to be any activity going on within the smaller tent. A lone camel waits near the large tent while his owner celebrates inside. The bandit's horses rest in the desert sun while their unsavory owners revel within the large tent. So, I sort of remember being able to, like, crawl here. But there's no crawl animation now, so I don't know if I remember incorrectly, like if I'm remembering from Quest for Glory 2. Because in Quest for Glory 2, you do crawl in the <laughs> in the the Sultan's palace to hide. So here we just walk around plain as day. Um And obviously with the open sesame story and the all of it, the the turbans, the tents, the camel, the the gold bridled horses. Um, this is borrowing heavily from an Orientalist um, Arabic esque um, 
motif uh, that, that I'm looking for the, a word and I'm not finding it. Um, Sierra really pulled heavily on Orientalism for flavor of their a lot of their games, and um, I'm sure they thought it was respectful and diversity and stuff, but. It did not, it, it did not age well in my eyes anyway. So snoring loudly upon a beautiful carpet, Graham spies a sleeping bandit. Assorted odds and ends clutter the inside of this small tent, while upon a lovely carpet sleeps another despicable renegade. A long staff at the back of the tent crashes Graham's interest. We have no stealth, this isn't quest for glory, so about the best we can do is we can choose whether to beeline for the staff this way or go around this this pole to demonstrate our s commitment to sneakiness. Taking care to be very quiet, Graham reaches out and takes the staff into his possession. So there, that's the amount of sneaky we can do. And now all we can do is leave. And that really bothered me, okay, as a kid. Uh, I really kept trying to figure out a way to, you know, maybe run the horses off so that all the men would go after the horses to get them or, you know, create a distraction in some way. Because in any books that I had read as a kid with bandits and women in their company, the women were never there willingly and happily. They, they were, you know, captives and being abused and hurt. So... <laughs> Like, as a kid, that just bugged me so much that I couldn't save the dancing girl. It literally never occurred to me that she might be there of her own free will, you know, working or, or happy to be there or whatever. So, um, for this Let's Play, we're going to assume that she is and that King Graham didn't just hurtlessly abandon somebody in need. Because that would make me sad. We don't know. Maybe they're nice bandits. Maybe they're like Robin Hood-esque and they only rob from the rich and give to the poor. Maybe the temple is where they store things before they can get them to, like, orphanages. So we have the staff and we, um... We'll open this door and we'll steal whatever's in there, orphanages be damned, and we'll never have any money problems again for the rest of the game, right? Because we're a king, we shouldn't have had money problems to begin with, but Cedric brought us here without letting us get a, even a coin purse first, or for that matter, tell somebody, open sesame, oh no, the staff broke, oh no. So that seems bad. And, um... That's a lot of gold for orphanages, so the staff broke, we're probably in a time limit here. We All we can do is grab stuff that's close to the door. There's a single gold coin by the door, I don't know if you can see it, it's just a little pixel. And there's a gold bottle, so let's grab the gold coin. Bending down, Graham hurriedly picks up the gold coin from the temple floor. Quickly, Graham grabs an old brass bottle. Oh, brass. The exit door is about to close. Did we make it? Phew, that was close. Can we pick up the staff? The staff lies in several broken pieces on the temple step. The staff is broken and is of no use anymore. I don't know, you'd think you could at least try taping it back together. Um. But yeah, it's funny to me that not only did we leave home without a chance to put money in our pockets, we didn't even have a chance to tell anybody what was going on. Some poor peasant is going to come to the castle for his daily delivery of, like, carrots or something. And be like, holy crap, there's no castle and the king is gone. That's bad. But I guess, I don't know who you put in charge whenever your castle evaporates. Some guy who owns the next castle over, I don't know. Good question. Do you have a contingency plan, Graham? What is it? You'd think Graham would. He, he was not born royalty. He was actually 
Um, so Graham was actually, oh, and we had to talk about that. Good point. Thank you. Good reminder. So here we are, back at the encampment. Well, there you are. I was starting to get concerned. Don't worry about me, Cedric. I'm used to this kind of thing. By the way, there's definitely bandits out there. You weren't wrong. So, um... I guess we'll just replace this one. We're out of room for save games. So we have to talk about this game series for a few seconds, and that means turning the volume down so we don't hear the aux lowing or whatever in the background. And that is the desert. We, we got a shoe from a skeleton, and we got a gold coin and a brass bottle. And with the gold coin, we're going to get our fortune toll, because I don't know if you remember from the last video, but that was the cost of fortune being told was a single gold coin. We have a gold coin now, so we're going to use it to get our fortune told. Um, but before we do that, we have to talk about um, the King's Quest series. So this is King's Quest V, which means there was four games before that, because back in the bygone era of the 80s and 90s um games were numbered that way you didn't get like 18 expansion packs and then like one number changed because it was the main game that was changed or whatever every game was its, its own number and it was all very nice and easy to categorize oh the good old days shakes my walking stick i actually have a walking stick i should get it and shake it while i tell this video um but so i digress king's quest one was about Graham as a young man, not a prince. He was not born royal. He was actually the um, chief head knight of the failing kingdom of Daventry. Daventry had been this um, very comfortable, well-off kingdom. And slowly over time, over a series of, you know, troubles and unrest, it had... Um, lost a lot of its grandeur and security. Um, the kingdom's treasures had been stolen by like, I don't know, dragons and Rumpelstiltskin and stuff like that. It was a weird game. We'll get to it eventually, maybe, probably. But well, all you need to know is that the, the, the old king, our liege, didn't have an heir. Um, and so he tasked his, his best, his trusted, his most beloved young knight, um, hey, if you could totally put together all the magical treasures that I've lost over the years, that would be good. And so Graham, not having anything better to do, said, hey, your wish is my command. And he went and gathered the three treasures. I think it was three. And the king said, awesome, you are totally king now. Ugh. Or something like that. Like I said, it's been a few years. But anyway, Graham proved his loyalty and his commitment to his kingdom. And he became king in the old king's stead. Um, which is why I was just joking that he should really have a better contingency plan than, you know, uh, 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 just relying on um, lineage because he, of all people can't get too snotty about people being born royal because he wasn't born royal. He's just a knight. Um, so that was King's Quest 1. King's Quest 2 was uh, Graham finding and rescuing the Princess Valenice. Uh, we met Valenice actually in our King's Quest 7 playthrough. She was the, the mom in that game. Um, Graham's wife, now Queen Valenice. Um, so K King's Quest 2 was about rescuing her from an evil witch, I believe, and saving her and getting married to her. And it was all very sweet and romantic and nice. Graham and Valenice then had two children. They had Rosella and Alexander. Rosella, we've already met. We, she was the blonde woman in King's Quest Seven, the daughter who got separated from Valenice and, um, her brother, her little brother, Alexander, was actually kidnapped when he was a baby. King's Quest Three, okay, is about Alexander's story. It picks up when Alexander is, I think he's about to turn 18 
And it's a little stressful because the guy who kidnapped him has been keeping him as a basically a captive slave who can't leave or and isn't allowed any freedom. Um, and the guy totally has a habit of killing the, the, the servants, the slaves, the captives that he keeps. Alexander is not his first. Um, he totally has a habit of killing them on or around their 18th birthday. So Alexander's life has, you know, an expiration date on it. Um, so King's Quest 3 is about Alexander escaping that guy. And part of the process of escaping that guy was actually turning him, okay, into a cat. So, just so we're clear, most cats good. One cat, evil wizard, who's been turned into that form by Alexander of Daventry. Most cats good. One cat, evil wizard. Okay, so we're good there. Um, King's Quest IV, it doesn't particularly matter here, but King's Quest IV is about uh, Graham getting very, very seriously ill and Rosella going on a quest to find a cure for him. And in that process, okay, is when she met and um, I, I was going to say liberated Edgar, but really he liberated her and then she liberated him and they sort of liberated each other together. Um, and so then we see Edgar again in seven and then King's Quest five is the one we're playing right now. So you're all caught up. Most cats good. One cat is an evil wizard turned into a cat by Prince Alexander of Daventry. Okay. Absolutely no reason did I tell you all that. I don't even know why I went on all that. Not relevant to this plot at all. It will cost you one gold coin to see Madame Mushka. I refuse to read them the 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 the, the, the dialogue in the racist, phonetically spelled out heavy accent, so I'm not gonna do that. You may see Madame Mushka now. So, you are here to see Madame Mushka, no? Well, come closer, sit down. I will tell you your fortune. Already, I can tell that you are on a quest of great urgency. We will see what we can find out for you. Look, King Graham, look into the crystal ball. Well, there's our castle. Look, Mononon. Look what I have for you. Take a good look at what you did to my brother, Alexander. Because of you, he's doomed to spend the rest of his days as a cat, and there's nothing I can do about it. But you can do something about it. Since you're the one that did this to him, you're the only one who can turn him back again. Back to the wizard, Mononon. Alexander! I don't know how, Mordak. I'm not a wizard. I just happened to stumble across some magic spells and accidentally turned him into a cat. I didn't mean it. Please believe me, Mordak. I don't know how to turn him back into a wizard. You're holding out on me, little man. You're taking advantage of my good nature, but not for long. If I don't get a change of tune from you soon, I'll feed your family to the cat. Starting with your dear mother. Remember what I said. I'll only give you a little more time to decide before your family becomes cat food. That is all. But I see that your mission is very dangerous indeed. I will give you something to help you. Here, wear this. It is a magical amulet. It will protect you against all but the most powerful magic. Good luck, King Graham. Be careful. That Mordak is a bad one. Thank you, Madam Mushka. Well, dang it. It turns out that our backstory actually has come to bite us after all. Um, 
the evil wizard that Alexander turned into a cat in order to escape has a brother. Don't you just hate it when that happens? Um, but at least we know now, you know, way back in, when we were talking to, to Crispin, Graham was going, why me? Why does Murdoch want my castle? And I was like, well, you know, I mean, maybe he just wants a castle. And uh, Maybe he wanted a castle and a family, and yours was kind of already outfitted with both those things. It's a castle and a family in it. But no, it turns out it actually was a personal vendetta against Graham's family. So we have that information. It's good to know. And we have an amulet, um, which probably doesn't hurt to use. The magic amulet begins to glow softly as Graham slips it over his head. He then carefully tucks the amulet into the front of his tunic, hiding it from sight. It will cost you one gold coin. Well, no, no, we're, we're out of coins and I think we're good now. So we are protected from all but the worst magic. What do you want to bet Mordak is the worst magic? But, um... I feel pretty confident that now we could take on something like a spooky forest. We've got, you know, we've got a magic amulet. We've got stuff in our pockets. Yeah, I, I think it's time. So let's, uh, let's hit that forest. Oh no, I'm not going in there. Can't you read the sign? Come on, Cedric, there might be something important in there. Go if you want to. I'll wait here. Scaredy owl. Scaredy bird. It seems to Graham there is an unusually large number of toads in this forest. And snarling roots. Creeping vines, decaying logs, and twisted, gnarled trees. The close feeling of the gloomy forest quickly overwhelms Graham. Well, maybe this wasn't the best idea, but we're here now. And there could be something important inside. Ah! To Graham's great relief, it appears that the witch's magic has been stopped by the amulet he is wearing just as Madame Mushka claimed it would. So she actually screams of all the ugly hags Graham has seen in his life, this is by far the ugliest. What are you doing in my forest, young man? Don't you know you're trespassing? Oh, I didn't know this was a private forest. Do you own it? Of course I own it, it's mine. And what did you do to my magic? I don't think you need to know. Now tell me something, how does one leave this terrible forest? I'll never tell. I'm afraid you're stuck, dearie. Now you're my prisoner. We'll see about that. Yes, won't we? We'll just walk right by her. We'll just ignore her. We'll give her the cut direct. Just don't even look at her. Can't see. Not looking at you. Cut direct. I want to get in there. That's a there's a bridge. There's a house. A small door fronts the odd structure, a crude, misshapen structure which seems to be some sort of house. It's forlornly surrounded by a hot, deep crevice. A grotesque bridge of rib-like bones crosses the hot crevice, where a path continues to the front door of the odd little house. Though she may look like an ancient old woman, this witch is really very powerful and much too strong to be shoved aside by a mere man as she staunchly defends her bridge. The dark forest seems to encase the witch's bizarre little house like a claustrophobic shroud. I really want that house. We have this bottle that we've been carrying since we visited the temple in the desert. We don't know what's in it, but maybe she'd be interested in it. What's this? Ah, freedom at last! Now you spend the next 500 years in that bottle. 
Whoops! Good! That old witch won't be seen here for a long time. But how to get out of this dreadful forest? What are the odds of that happening? It's a good thing we didn't open that bottle. So this is the witch's house. The old witch's house has been crudely fashioned from an old tree trunk and salvaged stone. It has a cold, creepy feeling to it, and Graham would just as soon leave. A set of narrow stone steps winds precariously upward into the back of the room. I think I have the volume just a little bit too loud. There we go. Graham spies a crude drawer built into the trunk of a tree, which is poking awkwardly through the house. An interesting incense burner hangs from a protruding tree branch. Occasionally, from within it, a tiny glint winks. Graham sees an intricate trunk tucked under a large crack in the wall, which seems to serve as a window. So let's open the drawer. A small pouch is tucked away in the drawer. Pick that up. Graham reaches into the drawer and removes the leather pouch. The winding steps are much too narrow for Graham to fit through. What's this? Why, it's a little key. And an intricate spinning wheel is tucked away in the trunk. Reaching into the, a hand into the trunk, Graham retrieves the small spinning wheel. It's very small. Kind of too small for Graham to use and too small probably for the witch. She wasn't, you know, much smaller than us. She was normal human sized. Well, what's this way? Unlike the other trees of this dismal forest, a little door has been built into the trunk of one large, grotesque tree. Can we open it? Graham tugs at the door in the tree, but finds it securely locked. Well, we pulled a key out of the witch's house. Graham finds that the little key fits perfectly in the lock. A little golden heart has been placed inside the crude door of the twisted old tree. Aw, look how pretty it is. It's like nestled in red velvet. Reaching a hand into the open door of the tree, Graham extracts the little golden heart. Alright, let's go down here and see if we can't leave. Maybe we can leave now that the witch is dead. I guess she's not technically dead. She's stuck in a, a bottle. So maybe her enchantments are still active. Yeah, we should have come out by now. The ent ex entrance exit should have been down here. Yeah, there's something going on. We can't seem to quite get out. Well, now what do we do? We need help. There's these little eyes peering curiously at him through the dark, heavy foliage of the dark forest. Graham notices several pairs of bright, blinking eyes. Can we call to them? Hello, who's there? Please help me. Please, oh, never mind. Well, what have we got? What's in this pouch? The small leather pouch is drawn tightly closed. Upon opening the leather pouch, Graham discovers three sparkling emeralds. I have emeralds. Will you come out for emeralds? Hey, can you help? He left. Maybe if we put it closer? Hey, hi, can you help us because... So, he's really fast. I don't know if we can catch him, but we do have this honeycomb. Squeezing the honeycomb as hard as he can, Graham causes the honey to drift out of it onto the ground, creating a little puddle of honey at his feet. Now all that's left of the honeycomb is a piece of beeswax, which Graham pockets. I know what I'm doing here. Ha <laughs> ha. Gonna catch a little guy. Gotcha. Please, let me go, I beg of you. Why should I do that? What will you do for me? I'll show you the way out of the forest if you let me go. How do I know I can trust you? I'll give you my word. An elf never breaks his word. Well, it's against my better judgment, but okay. 
Move over, Rocky. You're in our way. Oh. Sorry. Poor Rocky. So, all right. Follow me in here. Okay. Oh, look, there's like a dinosaur or something. Over here, I've got something for you. I never take anything without giving in return. For your generosity in giving me these exquisite emeralds, I give you my finest pair of shoes. May they help you in your quest. <laughs> he looks so happy. Follow that passage. That's the way out of the dark forest. And thank you very much for all your help. Oh, <laughs> thank you very much for your help. I'm sure I will be able to find a use for these fine shoes. <laughs> I lost track of who was speaking. Bye, he waves. Climbing back up. Hey, we moved that log after all. Oh, I'm glad to see you're okay. I was beginning to worry. You were right not to want to venture in that dark forest, Cedric. I thought I'd never get out of there alive. But we're out now, and we've got stuff. Let's go distribute it. I mean, the obvious thing is we're going to want to give the heart back to the willow tree. Poor thing. I've been worried about her since we met her. My heart! You found it! And there she goes, back into a human! I don't need this old thing anymore! Look at me! I'm a princess again! Herbert! Alicia! That's the prince we saw earlier. Where have you been all this time, my love? Oh, darling, just take me home. I'll tell you on the way. And off they go. A beautiful harp lies on the ground near the small pond. Does Cedric have anything to say? He's not paying attention. Bending down, Graham picks the harp up off the ground and takes it with him. Do we know how to play a harp? We do! Having learned how to play the harp long ago, Graham now plays beautifully. Awesome. Apparently we learned to harp in, like, night school. Alright, let's go down this way. I have a hunch, okay, that that spinning wheel did not belong to the witch. And since it was so tiny, and since there are gnomes basically on her doorstep, let's ask if they know anything about it. Where did you get this? I thought I'd lost it. Is it yours? I found it in the old witch's house in the dark forest. So that's where it got to. The old hag took it, eh? You know this ain't no ordinary spinning wheel. It's not? What's so special about it? This spinning wheel can spin straw into gold, that's what. Except you gotta know how to use it. I doubt even the witch could figure that out. Thank you for bringing it back to me. Wait, not so fast. How about that marionette? Don't you think the price of the spinning wheel is worth at least twice that of the puppet? I'd love to have it. Why? Why? Yeah, I guess so. Boy, give that marionette to this man here. I'll make you a new one. 
Hope you weren't emotionally attached to it or anything. <laughs> Come on, boy. Let's go gather up wood for a new puppet. I can't promise I won't give that one to a stranger either. Everything you know and love is fleeting and will be lost. <laughs> no, but really, why does Graham want this kid's toy? It's like, he's on a journey. He has no use for it. He's a king. He he. When he gets his castle and family back, he can commission one. Why is he so obsessed with it? And of course, the answer is that we need it for a puzzle. But still, it's just like... I enjoy the tears of small children. Yes, yes, I have taken your toys. Speaking of toys... There were a couple of shops in town that we didn't visit before, and I would like to visit them now. I have a hankering. I have a hankering to do some shopping. First, we will visit the toy store. Zoom. Watch us go. This is nice. Come in, look around. Let me know if you're interested in anything. A child's wonderland of toys fills this cute little toy shop. The plump old toy maker, who seems a jolly sort, carefully mends a toy while sitting comfortably behind a counter. A pretty little girl, who must be the toy maker's granddaughter, plays with a doll while grandfather looks on. Apparently the toy maker's son, working in the back room, is learning the toy business from his father. Hanging on the sidewall, Graham notices a strong little sled. That went by too quick to see, but the sun is saying that the shipment of wood they expected isn't in. If it's not in by tomorrow, I'll send you to visit the sawmill. Okay, Papa. Grandpapa? Yes, my darling? Can I keep this doll? I really like her. Now, Katrina, you know these toys are for sale for other children. Besides, you've got plenty of dolls. You can play with her, but just be careful. All right, Grandpapa, I'll take care of her. Oh my god, I've played this game so many times and I never noticed her name is Katrina. And of course, many people can share the same name and indeed as an author, I have often lamented that in, in, in fiction, it's considered bad form to use the same name twice for different two different people because I mean in real life that's that's constantly I know like 14 Rachels and 12 Johns but in a book you only get one John you only get one Rachel as a general rule so the fact that this girl's name is Katrina has nothing to do with the Katrina in in Quest for Glory 4 but I just the juxtaposition also of her having a doll and the Katrina in um, Close for Glory 4 has a living doll in Tanya who she, in, she who she, she befriended and got her trust by giving her a, a doll of her own. It just... It's Katrina! It's her origin story! <laughs> it all makes sense now! She was the granddaughter of a prosperous toy maker. Oh goodness. I'm sorry. I have levity. So let's look at this sled. It's bright and shiny. That's a fine sled, isn't it? Any child would love to have it. Yes, I was just admiring the worksmanship. Thank you. If you'd like to buy it, let me know. We have a marionette here. Maybe, I don't know, maybe he would buy it off of us and give us lots and lots of money. Or appraise it, at least. Where did you get this wonderful marionette? The craftsmanship is excellent. Well, I don't know if you'll believe me or not, but I got it from a little gnome. I must have it. Can I buy it from you? Actually, you may have it, if you'll give me the sled in trade. Why, of course, but I must tell you, I think I'm getting the better deal. I can always make another sled, but finding another marionette of this quality, I don't know. So I can have the sled? Yes, yes, take it, it's yours. And the girl's doll, we want that too. Thank you very much. I think I'll find this sled useful. Will you enjoy it? And thank you for the marionette. I want the doll. Give me your doll. 
The little girl is too interested in her doll. She pays no attention to Graham. Fine. Keep your doll. It'll do you little good when you grow up to become a vampire. I hope all of you have watched keep my heroes my uh, quest for glory four videos, because otherwise none of this will make any sense. And we had one other store to visit. Maybe we'll get some new shoes. Take a look around if you want, but we don't have any shoes to sell you right now. We sold our last finished pair yesterday. Business ain't doing so good anymore, and we're getting too old to keep trying. Is there anything I can do to help? There ain't nothing you can do short of buying us out. But like I said, if you want to look around, feel free. Thank you. The shoemaker's wife, looking haggard and worn, tiredly stitches away at a large piece of shoe leather. A skinny old dog lies down on the shoe shop's hard floor. The old shoemaker, eyes squinted and fingers calloused from years of making shoes, drives tiny nails into his shoe sole with a small cobbler's hammer. Business doesn't seem to be so good for the shoemaker and his wife. There isn't one pair of shoes for sale and the old couple look worn out. You don't have any shoes for sale, huh? That's right, no shoes at all. We're making a pair right now, but it'll take a while. We're not as fast as we used to be. Well, that's okay. My trusty boots should carry me through the rest of my journey. Sorry, son. We're doing the best we can. We have some shoes. They're the finest pair of shoes Graham has ever seen, but they're a bit small for his feet. We don't need them. Do they want to sell them? What over here? Mama, take those shoes from the young man. Let me see them. These are the finest pair of shoes I've ever seen. The leather is soft and pliable, yet sturdy. And craftsmanship of these shoes are superb. Mama, look at the solid gold buckle. I could retire with the sale of these shoes. The shoes are yours then. I don't think I could find any use for them. You're a godsend, young man. How can we ever repay you? Hammer, give me the hammer. You don't need to repay me. Just knowing I helped you is enough for me. It ain't much, but it's all I've got to give. Take my cobbler's hammer. Perhaps you can find a use for it. Yes, hammer! Since I'll be retiring, I won't need it anymore, thanks to you. Thank you. A hammer could get it come in mighty useful on my journey. Take care, young man. We'll never forget this. We'll finally be able to retire in comfort. You'll be in our hearts from now on. Come on, Mama. Let's go home and celebrate our good fortune. They... They haven't actually sold the shoes yet, but um, I'll buy that they don't actually need to, to stay in the store and hawk it to people coming in off the streets. Presumably they know um, their local clientele and what their shoe sizes are and who can afford something like those shoes. So uh, I, I find that reasonable. So we have done everything that we can do in town. Hi, Chip. Hello. You're not going to like this next part, Chip. I think you should cover your eyes. It's not good. Are you coming to lay down? Okay, there you go. Lay down. There's one more thing that we want to do. Before we go to the mountains, let's go visit that inn. I know, I know that the tailor said that the innkeeper was an unscrupulous fellow and he called him vulgar, but you know, they might, inns are where travelers stay, so they might have directions or gossip for us. Um, oops, stop, stop moving. There we go. Sorry, Chip hit the mouse. Um, Inns are where a lot of times you can buy food, so maybe we can buy food for our journey over the mountains, which, you know, surely we'll need. We needed water in the desert, so we'll probably need food in the mountains. Um, so, you know, how bad can it be? We can handle a little bit of vulgarity. Heck, I'm vulgar. So we might get along like two peas in a pod. So let's go visit that inn. This is the bake house, of course. We have to... Frantic squeakings alert Graham to a terrified rat. Oh no! 
He's being chased by the bakery cat. Well, we have a boot. Bam! Ten points. Thank you. Thank you, good sir. You saved my life. My children and I will never forget your kindness. Maybe someday I will be able to return the favor. Oh, I hear my children calling. Goodbye until we meet again. Wait, are you a field mouse or like a bakery mouse? Because it matters. I bought a pie from them. And we don't know what the local FDA regulations are about rat feces and pies. Maybe we shouldn't eat the custard pie. Just to be safe. But we don't want pie right now. We want to visit the inn. Whoops, you must save again. Yeah, I know. Save. Bakery. That's what I'm trying to do. I gotta be able to save games. I don't understand. We were able to do this before. Can we change directories? folks this is alarming well I'll have to figure it out um, no I need to figure it out now um, we will figure it out and come back to another video uh, so once again this has been King's Quest 5 my name is Anna Mardal and I will see you in the next video where hopefully we won't have technical difficulties until then <laughs> goodbye and wish me luck bye